Today is September 5th. It's the 249th day of the year, and this is the On This Day podcast. Today is International Day of Charity, declared as such by the United Nations General Assembly in 2012. It's a day to recognize the role of charity in alleviating humanitarian crises and human suffering. And it's observed on this day as today is the anniversary of Mother Teresa's death. Mother Teresa, the Albanian-born Catholic nun who devotes her life to helping the sick and the poor, the orphaned and the homeless, who receives the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979, is beatified in 2003, six years after she passes away on this day in 1997, and is canonized as St. Teresa just the day before, September 4th in 2016. Her work and the work of others like her is recognized and encouraged on this day, International Day of Charity. On this day in 1774, the first Continental Congress convenes in Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Tensions have been growing for years between the British Parliament and the American colonies. Britain is squeezing out as much revenue as possible from the colonists in the form of various taxes. Things come to a head in 1773 when in response to yet another tax act, the Stamp Act, Defiant American patriots destroy British property in what becomes known as the Boston Tea Party. Parliament is not amused. In response, they impose the coercive acts upon the residents of Massachusetts, known by the colonists as the Intolerable Acts. These acts are harsh and meant to suppress the growing rebellious nature brewing in Massachusetts. They also send a message to the other colonies. What's happening in Massachusetts can happen to you. The Intolerable Acts establish formal British military rule in Massachusetts, requiring American colonists to quarter and feed British soldiers in their homes while giving the soldiers immunity from prosecution in America. The time is right for the colonists to revisit an idea Benjamin Franklin floats just a year before, the assembly of a representative body of the colonies. In protest of the Intolerable Acts, the colonies send representatives to the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia. Delegates from 12 of the 13 colonies arrive, 56 delegates in total. Georgia is the only colony not to send delegates. They're holding out hope that the British will assist them with a Native American problem on their frontier, and they don't want to make the Brits mad. The delegates gather in Philadelphia starting on this day, September 5th in 1774. They elect Virginian Peyton Randolph to serve as the first president of the Congress. Though outraged by the actions of Parliament, the delegates are not all on the same page when they convene. Conservative and rebels have different goals they want accomplished at this meeting. In the end, they agree that reconciliation and compromise are the best course of action. For now. The delegates produce the Articles of Association, proposing a boycott on British goods if the intolerable acts are not rescinded by December. Clauses within the Articles also include a ban on the slave trade, a severance of economic ties with Britain, a provision for colonial conduct during the boycott, and a desire to improve agriculture and industry within the colonies. They're careful not to criticize King George III. Parliament is seen as being responsible for the intolerable acts. They do, however, put forth a petition to the king, conveying their unhappiness at the current state of affairs. The petition expresses a desire to maintain relations with Britain as long as certain demands are met. It shows the colonies are loyal to the monarchy rather than to Parliament. 
The Continental Congress agrees to meet again the following year if their petition falls on deaf ears. There is no response from Parliament, nor from the King. The colonies implement their boycott, and by the time the delegates gather again in 1775 for the Second Continental Congress, revolutionary warfare has already begun. The seeds for a united colonial representative body are sown when the First Continental Congress convenes on this day in 1774. On this day in 1921, beloved silent film star Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle is enjoying a raucous three-day shindig in room 1219 at the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco. The party, arranged by his friend Fred Fishbach, is a celebration of Arbuckle's recently released movie, Crazy to Marry. Life is good for Arbuckle. He's a comic actor at the height of his fame, and he's just signed another unprecedented million-dollar contract with Paramount Pictures. By the end of the week, he is accused of rape and manslaughter. Disgraced and he sits in cell number 12 on Felony Row at the San Francisco Hall of Justice, held without bail. The accounts of the boozy bash on this day in 1921 are hazy and inconsistent. What is known is that 26-year-old aspiring actress Virginia Rappé and Arbuckle have some sort of interaction. Rappé is heard screaming out and found in her clothes and in pain, sprawled on his bed. Arbuckle maintains innocence. Rappé is seen by a hotel doctor who determines she's intoxicated. She rests at the St. Francis Hotel for a few days before it's clear she requires further medical attention. Rappé is taken to a hospital where she dies the next day on September 9th from a ruptured bladder. While at the hospital, witness Bambina Maud Delmont tells the doctor that Rappé has been raped, and she accuses Arbuckle. This is plausible. Fatty Arbuckle weighs in at 266 pounds. His weight could easily have ruptured Rappé's bladder. Fatty Arbuckle is charged with manslaughter. And it's a colossal scandal, splashed across the front pages of newspapers all across the country. Newspapers owned by William Randolph Hearst. Hearst will later say the scandal sold more papers than the sinking of the Lusitania. Arbuckle is raked over the coals in three different manslaughter trials. His main accuser, Bambina Delmont, never takes a stand. She's a convicted criminal who admittedly plotted to extort money from him. Rappé's reputation as a party girl, her chronic history of cystitis, which is a urinary tract infection, aggravated by alcohol and prior abortions, strengthen the defense's argument that Rappé's own health conditions led to her demise. The first two trials end in mistrials. In the third... The jury takes six minutes to render their verdict. Five of those minutes are spent writing a formal apology to Arbuckle, stating, quote, Acquittal is not enough for Roscoe Arbuckle. We feel that a great injustice has been done him. We feel also that it was only our plain duty to give him this exoneration under the evidence, for there was not the slightest proof adduced to connect him in any way with the commission of a crime. Though acquitted, Fatty Arbuckle is shunned by Hollywood in the first major Tinseltown scandal that begins on this day in 1921 with a wild party at the St. Francis Hotel. That is, he's shunned for a while. He changes his name to William Goodrich. It's his father's first and middle names. He finds work again as Goodrich, this time as a director. And in 1927... He discovers a new comedian, Bob Hope. Six years later in 1933, 
Warner Brothers offers Arbuckle a feature film contract, which he happily signs. That same night, he dies of a heart attack at the age of 46. There are 117 days left in the year. On This Day is produced by me, Dave Schultz. Thank you very much for listening. Today's episode is another one written by Elizabeth Schultz. Liz is cranking out a few more episodes as I speak, and I couldn't be more excited about that. Making this little family business. Born on this day in 1850, Jack Daniel, founder of Jack Daniel's Tennessee Whiskey Distillery. Also born on this day in 1929, Bob Newhart. Please tell me I don't have to tell you who Bob Newhart is. And born on this day in 1946, Farouk Bassara, better known as the greatest rock star who ever lived, Freddie Mercury of Queen. So if you're still listening, don't stop me now. Talk to you tomorrow.